Ooh, here we go. <laughs> All right, Mary, I think we're ready when you are. Great, if I could have everyone mute uh, that is presently not talking. Uh, thank you to the press and our city uh, leadership for joining today. With us, we have uh, Chief Madera Arredondo, our city attorney, Jim Router, uh, interim civil rights director, Frank Reed, litigation manager, Tracy Fussy, and assistant city attorney, Sarah Lathrop. Uh, with them, they bring decades worth of experience in their respective areas. Uh, so we are moving forward with, with three changes, and they are geared towards increasing accountability, uh, helping ensure that when a resident files a complaint, that complaint is heard and given the review that it deserves, and ultimately improving the likelihood uh, of dis disciplinary decisions being upheld in the arbitration process through stronger investigative work. Uh, so today we are marking another very important step in our broader commitment to creating a more fair, a more just and accountable police department. And so here's what we're doing. First, we are embedding a city attorney on the front end of police misconduct investigations to increase investigation integrity. Uh, so let me explain what that looks like. Rather than finding out near the end or even worse before an arbitrator, that an internal affairs or OPCR investigation is deficient or information was missed, we can strengthen our work with an additional level of expertise on the front end. Uh, this support could take the form of reviewing evidence and investigative interviews to determine if areas of investigation should be further pursued or uh, looking over investigative summaries to provide guidance in analyzing available evidence. And I know our city attorney uh, is on with us now and will be able to further discuss that work. Uh, so let me explain why this is so important. In Minnesota, uh, more than 50% of all discipline and discharge decisions uh, are reduced or overturned completely through this arbitration process. And arbitrators will often cite due process concerns, including faulty investigations as the reason for overturning those decisions. That's unacceptable. Uh, while we can't predict or control how arbitrators will act, what we can do is continue exercising control over our internal processes and enhance the integrity of our investigations. In other words, we want to take every reason that stems from City Hall for overturning a disciplinary decision off the table. I'll say it again. We want to take every reason that stems from City Hall for overturning a disciplinary decision off the table. Second, we're gonna assign a city attorney to provide expert legal advice to the chief at the time of the disciplinary decisions. Uh, this measure will add much needed capacity and support on a more guaranteed basis and help ensure also that our chief Ardondo is getting real time information and support as these decisions are being made in real time. And I'll let the chief speak to the more operational impact of that support. Uh, finally, we will be embedding staff from the city attorney's office with the MPD training unit to review training materials prior to delivery. Chief Arredondo and I have issued a number of new policies and we've moved quickly in partnership with the state to advance a handful of others. Uh, successful implementation of these policies will rely on very clear on precise training materials to ensure instructors are successful in imparting the necessary knowledge and tactics to the officers. It doesn't, it's not enough good to just pass a policy. We need to make sure that it is instilled, embedded in our training. And so having another set of, of experienced eyes on the content will certainly help ensure that all trainings are consistent with MPD's values, with our city's values and fostering a culture of accountability uh, and professionalism. These changes will ultimately help hedge against uh, profound consequences simply because an I wasn't dotted or a T was left uncrossed. Uh, and our communities, especially our communities of color, have too often 
uh, pay the price for internal shortcomings. And we as a city cannot allow a, a file languishing on an overworked investigator's desk to boost the odds of a bad cop getting put back on the street. We've seen the consequences and we know that they can be traumatic and it's our obligation to correct any gaps in the process. Uh, our city, uh, city attorney's office uh, should be uh, better embedded in these processes. Uh, they've seen arbitration decisions overturned when they shouldn't have been. They've seen the city defend officers who should have been removed from the department long ago. They know where the pitfalls are and they're uniquely situated to address them. So what we're laying out today is a, is a product of uh, many long and hard conversations, a whole lot of hard work from a ton of people. Uh, but I, I really want to call out our, our city attorney's office and specifically uh, Tracy Fussy and, and Sarah Lathrop for taking new ideas and running with them and our newish city attorney uh, and Jim Router for really encouraging them to do so. Um, I'm, I'm really gr glad that this work is now coming forward uh, and, and I'm, I'm certainly proud to partner and work with them. Um, so those are some of the basics. I'm going to turn it over to our resident experts in their respective areas to give a rundown of, of where we go from here and why this is so important. Uh, and I'll be handing it off to Chief Arredondo, who has extensive experience in this work. And I'll note uh, he served as the commander of the Internal Affairs Unit. I believe it was back in 2012 and 2013. So he has a, a firsthand uh, uh, glance at, at how this work functions and where gaps are and where improvements can be made. Uh, Chief Arredondo, take it away. Thank you so very much, uh, Mayor Fry. Uh, for our uh, callers on the line today, I want to say that uh, uh, I'm so appreciative of the support. Uh, myself, Mayor Fry, uh, we've been uh, working on transformative change at the Minneapolis Police Department uh, since I stepped into my role as chief uh, about three years ago, uh, and that work continues. Um, I want to make one thing absolutely clear. Um, good peace officers do not want bad officers on the MPD. They tarnish the badge, they forsake our oath of office, and they destroy the great and important work that so many of our men and women do each and every day in service to our communities. Um, trust is a cornerstone uh, of the work that we do here uh, at the MPD. So having efficient, thorough, and timely complaint investigations uh, helps to support that trust. Uh, but uh, the MPD has had challenges, uh, capacity challenges uh, over the past couple of years. And so uh, this additional uh, aid and, and resources uh, specifically to our internal affairs unit uh, alongside of the OPCR, uh, this will absolutely um, help to build that trust. And, and, you know, when you have capacity challenges, the one thing uh, that Mayor Fry noted about this work that's about integrity, uh, we will not take shortcuts. This uh, integrity is so vitally and critically important um, to our uh, residents, our community members, and also for due process for those officers who are, are named in a complaint. And so we cannot take shortcuts, but when you have capacity challenges, um, sometimes that work can come to, it becomes very slow. And, and, uh, and that can also uh, create challenges with uh, community trust. So I'm, I'm very excited about uh, the additional resources. We as an MPD and certainly our internal affairs investigative team, uh, they work very closely uh, with uh, city attorney routers, uh, 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 assistant city attorneys. Uh, and so that work will be ongoing. But as Mayor Fry indicated, one of the things that we have not done is we have not really had their guidance and input uh, at the front end. And so that's very important from the time that the investigators receive the initial complaint um, to as they're working that case um, until its ultimate uh, uh, outcome, or certainly that case when it's completed uh, comes on my desk. And so, uh, so I think this is very important. Um, we are lucky that we have a, uh, the capacity now with the assistance of the city attorney's office to do this work. And I think it'll be very helpful. And so, Again, these uh, these new initiatives and additional resources will help in those processes. And uh, at the all at the end of the day, we want to make sure that we have uh, that we're thoroughly investigating these cases. That are uh, those that brought these cases forward, these complaints uh, forward, uh, that they know that they're being done in a thorough, uh, complete, 
uh, way and that uh, those uh, employees that are involved in these, uh, that they know that they're getting the due process and they're being looked upon thoroughly as well. So uh, I'm, I'm excited about this new change and um, look forward to uh, us enacting this uh, very soon. With that, uh, Mayor Fry, I will turn it over to our city attorney, uh, Jim Rotter. Thank you, Chief, and, and thank you, Mayor Fry. You know, the first thing um, that I committed to doing when I first arrived to this role in late August was to listen and learn from the very talented and dedicated individuals on the city attorney office uh, team. And in this respect, I've learned a lot from the experiences of, lit of our litigators, uh, particularly on managing attorney Tracy Fussy's civil litigation team, who have been involved with managing police misconduct litigation and also from our human resource lawyers who defend police disciplinary decisions in the grievance and arbitration process. Ultimately, I discovered that we as a city could do more to improve our internal investigations and improve our defense of disciplinary decisions by engaging the city attorney's office upstream in the process. I've also brought with me decades of experience at my former job in leading a legal team that was positioned and tasked with doing as much or more proactive work to address risks, as we were also expected to react to legal challenges. So our goal here is ultimately to be as proactive as possible in our legal work at the city attorney's office. And this is a great opportunity to put to good and effective use the experiences and legal knowledge of, of our attorneys here to help the chief and the city enhance the quality, speed and effectiveness of internal investigations and resulting disciplinary decisions. To that end, we're going to work with the chief's team to put in place some new processes that allow for members of the city attorney's office to consult and advise in real time on internal investigations, which will then lead to the city attorney's office consulting directly with Chief Arredondo on his decisions involving discipline. The main goal is stronger investigative work and stronger and sound disciplinary decisions. You know, ultimately, our team has seen firsthand how we can better support our institutions. And if misconduct goes unchecked, then that erodes trust with those institutions. And then it makes the important work that we all have to do carry, uh, to, to carry out more difficult. At the end of the day, more accountability will be good news for good officers and also for the city of Minneapolis. Uh, next, I'd like to turn it over to our uh, director of civil rights, uh, Frank Reed. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my comments are going to be uh, brief. Um, I wanted to let everybody know exactly what OPCR, Office of Police Conduct Review, is and what we do. Uh, it is a neutral agency within the city of Minneapolis that investigates allegations of police misconduct. Um, and we work very hard at doing that work. Um, it is the beginning point in a very long process to keep officers um, who are, are involved in misconduct accountable. Um, with that, I want to talk just a little bit about uh, the folks that work in OPCR. Um, their level is, uh, of commitment is real. The time and effort that they devote to the work is equally real. Their professionalism is tangible. Uh, they strive, every one of them, to achieve and to do their work well. Um, and I think the key here is that they feel supported in the work that they do. Um, they also believe, as does the Department of Civil Rights and the city in general, uh, that there is always room to improve, to do the work better, to be more efficient. Um, and that has ever been our rallying cry, and it will continue to be so uh, moving on. Um, that's really all I wanted to say uh, with regard to the, the work being done here. Um, I think that uh, uh, this new initiative's objectives are good in that they're supportive of um, doing the work better. Uh, I think I go uh, goes back to you now, Mayor. Right. Uh, thank you, uh, Director, and 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 thank you for your work on this endeavor. Um, I believe that the next person up is uh, is Tracy Fussy, uh, who has done quite a bit of work in this particular subject area. Ms. Fussy. Um, thank you, Mayor. Um, I can tell you um, this is something that we've been working on for some time. 
Um, we had the idea in our office um, back in, gosh, I would say June or July. Um, and we were as we were trans transitioning into a new city attorney, um, the first time that we talked on the phone, we were probably scheduled to talk for about 30 minutes and we ended up talking for three hours. And I pitched this idea to him and he um, thankfully is extremely supportive of being innovative. And, um, and, and as I think I've said to you before, Mayor, um, lawyers tend to be kind of biased and think that um, lawyers can handle a lot of different things and have some good expertise. And, and I also share that bias. Um, and and I'm, I'm really excited um, to turn into uh, this kind of a new chapter um, of ensuring in accountability and working so closely with the chief who has been on the ground level very supportive of this and in fact his first conversation I had with him he's like great when is this happening um, and we've had only incredible experiences with the chief and his commitment and to have the support of you, Mayor, and your staff, and um, and the city attorney, and the chief, and Director Reed, working through uh, how how the logistics of this. I think this is um, an opportunity to create meaningful and swift impact by providing an expertise in um, identifying how how we can question uh, people to um, determine uh, what happened, providing all the evidence, and as. As you've alluded to before, my colleagues and I have decades of experience defending um, allegations of police misconduct and supporting uh, the city and its chief in the arbitrations of these matters. Um, and for that reason, we're definitely in an absolutely unique position from the gate of understanding the law, understanding why officers need to do what they need to do in certain situations and why in other situations the behavior was not warranted. Um, and with that expertise, our hope is to offer support um, and we're very we're very happy to do that. And we're thinking that, um, you know, we can transition into working through how this is going to look logistically um, very soon. We're already talking about how we're going to put the pieces together. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Fussy. Uh, both you and, and Ms. Lathrop and uh, Mr. Ratter have done just incredible work throughout. I appreciate the work. I also appreciate, Ms. Fussy, your willingness to uh, jump on and, and speak uh, to this uh, when I inadvertently called on you out of the agenda here. So uh, thank you for that as well. Um, so uh, we're, we're new to this here in terms of, of the IT of this situation, but we're going to open it up to, to questions. And for those logging on with Teams, if you could put yourself in queue uh, by raising your hands. Um, and then if you're on the phone, you can hit star six to unmute. So we'll do our best to answer questions, uh, but uh, certainly follow up with uh, uh, Tara if we don't get to you. Um, so I see right off the bat, I see uh, Max uh, from uh, Minnesota Reformer. Go for it. Hi, Mayor Fry and uh, Chief Arredondo. Thank you for taking my question. Um, Chief, you, you said good police officers do not want bad officers on the MPD. And you pointed to arbitration as uh, a reason why uh, bad officers stay in the force. And I wonder if you can just tell me how many bad officers or people who you think are unfit for being on the Minneapolis Police Department are currently on the force. So thank you for your question. So um, when I talk about uh, good peace officers not wanting bad officers, um, I, I, I say that in, in terms of, of uh, the men and women who, who go into this profession, as I know of them, uh, this, this truly is a calling. And, and that um, working uh, in, and uplifting our values is so very important. They do this work out of a love of service. And so they don't want any uh, uh, employee to, to do anything to uh, discredit uh, those values, the oath, and the hard work that they're, they're, they're doing. Um, so what I will say in response to that is um, when it comes to my attention, whether that be through a, um, uh, a complaint that is filed, and it is found that an employee has committed uh, misconduct, um, then they have to be held accountable. And uh, 
and so but i think that's i i think again if you if you talk to uh, officers they don't want they don't want anyone on this job to make their uh to make their service uh to diminish their service to erode the trust that they've worked so hard for in their communities and so uh so anytime we have a, an employee that uh has found to have uh, violated uh the oath to have uh, uh, engaged in misconduct then uh, we have to we have to make sure there's measures there to hold them accountable And, and I, if there was a second part to that question, I apologize. Oh, no, I guess I was just asking how many officers do you think are unfit to be on the force right now, given the, um, you have the discipline? Yeah, so no, I, I, I look at it that everyone who wears this badge, who comes into work every day, uh, should be fit, should, should have made uh, the decision when they took that oath that day that uh, they're going to serve in a way that is um, that is honorable, uh, that puts their communities first, and uh, would not do anything to violate the uh, the community trust. Um, and so that's that's how I approach that. Thank you. Yeah, Liz Navratil. Uh, can you help us understand in the past at what point were the city attorneys uh, getting involved in this discipline process? Was it the very end? Was it somewhere in the middle? at all and at what point will we see these changes start to come online and you have to shift staff or, or money to get this new effort working i think this question is best directed to uh, Ms. fussy thank you um as so i started up through litigation um and i kind of stayed in my lane so it's not necessarily uh, i don't have all of the history of the of the cao but at, as presently it had been the um the city attorneys would get uh, involved during the arbitration, so after a grievance would take place. Occasionally, um, at the point when discipline, discipline and the level of discipline was being considered. Um, as I, I alluded to before, and this might be a more of a question for City Attorney Rowder, but we were already in the process of moving forward with this and determining uh, our staffing, current staffing levels, which we think there should be some wiggle room in allowing current positions to provide for this. Uh, and so we've already started this process. But if Jim, if you have a further clarification, that would be wonderful. Uh, no, you did great, Tracy. I mean, ultimately, you know, I still have only been here for a short period of time, but I think this is the big change for us is, is the true opportunity to be in in real time in both processes, both the investigative stage and the, and the decision making on discipline. Uh, I'm sure there are some situations where maybe we were involved, maybe we weren't or maybe we were at the end. I think we're now trying to come up with a, a process where we're consistently involved right from the beginning and we can support the chief and the department and the city as a whole so that we're just going to make the best decisions possible and be in the best position uh, on the back end when we are uh, dealing with grievance and arbitration challenges on disciplinary decisions. And I do think we can get this up and running fairly functionally within the next couple of months. Um, and certainly the goal would be by mid-year to be uh, to really have it permanently installed, so to speak. So, And I'll, I'll add, yeah, we, we look to have kind of full implementation in the coming months. In the coming weeks, though, uh, you'll we'll start to see changes. Next up, uh, Jennifer from CCO. Thank you. Um, you said Mayor, during um, the beginning of your remarks that too often people in our community have paid the price for our shortcomings. There has been criticism that discipline in the department doesn't go far enough. Um, we're talking about the back end a lot right now, but will that be addressed on the front end as well as part of this? That's a, a huge part of the uh, underlying reasoning for moving forward right now. Um, too often our city's attorney, or city attorneys have only been involved on the back end uh, prosecuting uh, an officer through an arbitration hearing, and they've seen gaps in the process or, or shortcomings where we can improve. Um, by instilling them and embedding them in the process from the get-go, uh, we can make sure that we're actually seeing accountability and seeing it through, and disciplinary decisions have a, a better likelihood of sticking from the get-go. And, uh, you know, we have a, a, a full and a complete line of, of questioning through the investigative process to make sure that we're touching on all the correct items. Having a, an additional uh, 
uh, having an additional individual that is that is prepared and ready to review uh, the summaries, uh, ensure that the right questions have been asked. I mean, that can only be fruitful in ensuring additional accountability. Thank you. I see Dave Koblick. Yeah, hi, Mayor. This is <clears throat> Dave Kolpak with the Associated Kolpak. Press. Um, can somebody tell me where things stand with the union contract right now? Uh, I can. I'm very limited on what I can say, of course, re regarding the negotiations themselves of the union contract. As you know, um, the old contract has expired but remains in place. Um, I'll, I'll direct that perhaps to our, our city attorney um, who can elaborate even further, but I, I don't think there's a lot more we can say other than that we're, we're actively working through the process right now. Yes, you're correct, Mayor. Um, the, I think the only thing I might add is obviously uh, to where at the end of this uh, year in the last council session, we uh, received approval from the council to take advantage of some additional support from the Jones Day law firm. Uh, and specifically that support is going to uh, uh, assist our office as well as uh, the labor relations team with, with the ongoing uh, process on the negotiations as well as grievance and arbitration activity. Um, so there's a lot of work to do in that space in 2021. Yeah, and, and I'll, I'll add to it that this contract with the Jones Day Law Firm helps to give us uh, some additional muscle uh, in an area where uh, due to you know 50 percent of the decisions uh, being overturned, um, you know we needed we needed some additional uh, help. We needed some additional muscle, and they'll they'll certainly be providing that in the coming months. I see a question from Max. Uh, unless that's uh, the the previous uh, question, go for it, Max. Thanks. Um, I uh, I have another question. Um, you mentioned at the beginning of your remarks that um, files are languishing on overworked investigators' desks. And I wonder how adding the city attorney will speed up that process or help um, what you say are overworked investigators. Uh, well, it's, it's an excellent question. I was speaking as a, as a generality and not regarding any one specific case. I mean, the, when you go through the investigative process, there's a number of bureaucratic hurdles, many of which are entirely necessary to ensure the integrity of the process and to ensure that every single rock is being uh, turned over. Um, some of that happens through OPCR. Some of that happens through um, is, is, is required through, a, you know, a union contract. Um, uh, some of that happens through our internal affairs, depending on whether the individual submitting the complaint wants um, a civilian or uh, a sworn individual to be doing the review. Um, but in all of these instances, having some additional eyes with a legal mindset um, and, and the ability to further question, um, I think is, it would, would be helpful. And to answer your question, I think more uh, specifically, um, you know, having someone there that can is able to consistently bird dog the process um, to make sure that we're following up and nothing is sitting on our side of the court, um, I think is going to be helpful in the long run for reducing the amount of time that it takes to get through the full investigation into a final disciplinary measure. Now, you know, like I said, you know, it, it, that is part of the goal of this is to reduce the amount of time. Um, but like any new program, um, as we get up and running, um, you know, we're going to need to 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 figure out how the, the procedure actually works, and I'm sure we'll need to rejigger things. Um, Tracy, can you perhaps elaborate at all? I sure can. I think maybe an analogy to um, kind of what we currently do in the litigation department works. When we have a big case, we don't have one attorney on the file running the show. We have multiple attorneys on the file because we can get more work done more efficiently. We can brainstorm the process and work together. That's when, when you have another set of eyes on it, that's when you find out what the problems are. Everyone is going to miss things. Absolutely everyone is going to miss things. But if you have another person there that you're working with that can point that out to you, then you can get it done at a time when it matters, not after an arbitration is overturned. And so what my thought process is, Initially, there prop there could be very well uh, a learning curve where it takes a little more time, you know, to adjust to a kind of a more rigorous schedule and how an attorney would handle it. Um, 
but I've worked, I've, I've met the, you know, investigators in OPCR and they're all incredibly intelligent. Uh, they will pick up the, the new process, work with us. And I think the focus should be on the quality of the investigation rather than uh, running through them more quickly and more efficiently. I mean, obviously we want to be efficient, but we don't want to be quick for brevity's sake. We want to get it done right so that it has the lasting impact. And if we don't do that, then what's the point? Um, when misconduct goes unchecked, everybody suffers. And so let's get rid of, let's stop that. This is Joe Augustine from KSTP. Uh, this is a question I believe for Mr. Router, but I may have a follow-up for the chief and the mayor. Um, our reporting from last summer identified a pattern in which officers have uh, been found to have lied or misled um, in their reports about their use of force or had omitted key details about their use of force or did not disclose it altogether. Um, I, we've identified that several of those officers are still on the force today. My question is for the city attorney, as you start to review these cases, does that increase the city's liability in future litigation down the road involving those officers? Thank you for the question. Um, obviously, it's not helpful to the defense of litigation. Uh, we need our witnesses to be truthful and we need our officers to be truthful in everything they do. Um, so it goes without saying that if, if someone is not being truthful and they are a party to a piece of litigation that our office is managing for the city, that's not a good thing. Um, that said, I think one of the things I've talked about with my team as well as the chief is, um, I think we also have to look at consequences for that behavior in say litigation uh, and i'm not so sure that that's something we've focused on in the past but it's certainly something we're going to focus on going forward that uh truthfulness and straightforwardness uh in in these internal investigations regarding conduct uh is going to be paramount and it's it's not a it's not an ask it's a requirement uh and we will uh work with our partners here uh, to to uh, address those instances uh, going forward uh, in a very uh, direct and appropriate way. So, following up on that, then for the chief, chief as the former head of the internal affairs, what is the appropriate discipline for an officer who is not truthful or is misleading in their report or does not disclose uh, their use of force and is later found to, to have their version of events of events completely discredited by let's say video evidence what is the appropriate discipline for those officers yeah thank you thank you for that question i i want to first say that that is uh truthfulness strikes to the heart of what our values are uh i i also know that um you, there's each case is can be very different uh, you know, we, we do come across cases where uh, uh, you could have a large scene and an officer uh, in the totality of everything that happened may have may have uh, failed to mention a portion of the force that they didn't use, but wasn't wasn't uh, being um, intentionally untruthful about all of their actions that took place that day. In the, in the speed of the events that occurred, it may have been that they they forgot recorrected it during a secondary interview or what have you. So I, I don't I don't want to um, uh, place a blanket statement over this, but if but clearly and by the way, within our policy, if if an employee is known to have intentionally lied, um, that is that is of the most egregious in terms of our discipline, uh, we call a discipline guideline or matrix, um, and that is a, a terminable uh, offense. Um, but again, there's there's not there's there's instances and there's different situations that have occurred where it was deemed that the uh, the employee was not intentionally trying to lie. They may have forgotten something, uh, and then the the record was corrected later. So, uh, but but intentional lying in and of itself, uh, we actually in our policy uh, that can be a terminable offense. And again, it has to run through the process just because I. Uh, given outcome of decision and discipline. Um, there's, as you know, there's a grievance process, there's an arbitration process and all of that. Uh, but clearly, uh, we have to, truthfulness, that's the cornerstone of the work that we do. And, and I'll add what that is it, what is the, I have uh, consistently advocated for uh, reform in the arbitration process, and specifically, uh, we wanted instances of either egregious use of force or lying on a formal document uh, to not be 
questioned by the arbitrator. So in other words, where discipline is seen or terminations uh, are had because of one of those two instances, we've been advocating uh, for there not to be, not to go through the typical arbitration process and instead for those decisions to remain in place. Um, next question. I appreciate for, that, Mayor. Just a one quick follow-up on that though, because I'm not really speaking to the arbitration process necessarily, but the internal process preceding the arbitration process. And Chief, going back to your comments, you kind of are, I guess, suggesting there's some ambiguity there on what intentional lying is. Um, my question, I guess, giving you know, a hypothetical, if an officer describes their use of force as X and then video shows Y, what does that mean for you who has to review and decide how to discipline that officer? So I still no, that's a great question. That, that, that's a great question. And so uh, I have to look at everything that the investigators uh, prepare in that case report and, and it gets to my desk, then I have to make that decision based on uh, that information uh, that I have. And so, uh, again, I know you're talking hypothetical. So in, in generalities, I have to I have to look at all of that information uh, that is presented to me. And then and then make the ultimate decision on that. And, and this is Chief, part one of final why, question for you. Just and no, I'm sorry, we got to move to the we've got a few more people that want to talk here. And this is part of sure. why this uh, uh, this is part of why this particular change is so important is is so that the chief has a, a better, more complete vantage point and perspective um, as he's making his final decisions in terms of, of discipline and or termination. Um, next, we've got Paul Bloom, who's on the line. Uh, if you want to hit star six. Hello. We can hear you. Hello, Mayor Fry. Uh, thanks, guys. Paul Bloom here, Fox 9 News. Just a quick question, uh, kind of random, but just, uh, you know, the reference to capacity right now and resources. I'm just wondering, as it stands, you know, currently, uh, Chief, are you low to take a cop off the street at the minute just because of, uh, of current numbers and staffing levels around the city? Or are you, uh, can you bench somebody or, or pull someone back uh, if, 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 uh, if the discipline warrants it right now? Good afternoon, Mr. Bloom. So are, are you saying that um, if if an employee's been um, involved in misconduct, am I loath to take them, if they're a patrol officer, to take them off the street because of staffing yeah. or is? Yeah, yeah, like oh, right now, I, if someone violated a policy, can you, I mean, just manpower wise, can you, if, if discipline determines a two week suspension, can that be authorized now? And can your department sort of withstand, you know, a few officers, you know, being pulled off the street for behavioral uh, misconduct right now. Oh, yeah, if, if an employee is involved in misconduct that, that uh, ultimately gets to me and uh, the facts lay out that they did, I'm not worried about staffing at that point. The, the, the community trust and, and that, that sacred uh, pact that we have, that the social contract, that will outweigh the staffing to me. Yeah, if it, if it deems that uh, uh, they, they should not be out there in the community, then I'll, I'll absolutely pull them off the street. Thank you for the question. Thank you, Chief. Thank we'll you. do one more question uh, directed towards Liz Navarro. Uh, just to sort of clarify, is the idea that the city attorney's office would get in these reviews only after a civilian files a complaint, or would this also apply if the police department is on its own deciding to start an investigation into an officer? And how many of the logistics have you worked out? Is the idea that city attorneys might sit in on interviews, that they might review files afterwards, or are you still working through those logistics? Ms. Fussy. I, my apologies, Liz. Could, could you repeat the first part of that question? Yeah, I know there was um, a lot of talk about what happens after a civilian files a complaint with OPCR. If the police department sees something on its own, either in, in body camera or in witness statements or whatever, would the city attorneys also get involved in those kinds of discipline decisions? Or is this only is this change only taking place after a civilian files a complaint? No, absolutely not. We should be there. Um... Whenever there's a complaint filed, we'll work. We'll support IA and we'll support OPCR from wherever the complaint comes from. That that shouldn't be an issue in determining whether we're supporting it. Um, in terms of the level of support uh, that we want to provide, I think we're all in. Um, we're happy to do 
um, what the chief uh, and the mayor and, and director Reed are wanting us to do to the level that they want us to do it. Um, um, and then I think the other part of your question um, was whether we would sit in on interviews. Um, I think that that kind of remains to be seen. Um, what whether we'd actually be in the interviews, whether we would be reviewing um, the interview transcripts after they happened. I think I'd, probably a good analogy on this is um, I think in in uh, criminal law, I think the prosecutors often will work with the police officers and review what they've done and help them troubleshoot where where you're where we're coming up short and what else we need. And so. Um, perhaps in the beginning, we would sit in on the interviews um, just to sort of provide kind of a training um, to investigators. Um, and then, you know, perhaps later we could transition out and, and serve more of the function of just providing that additional oversight after the initial interview is done or after an initial case summary is prepared, um, just to compare it to uh, the law and in, you know, in years of litigation and especially when you've gone to trial, you realize quickly um, where uh, you think that you know what someone's going to say on the stand and then it changes. And um, and so that's an additional um, amount of expertise that we can bring in reviewing transcripts and determining what other questions need to follow up where we're still confused. Um, does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Well, thank you so much, everybody, um, to uh, all of the press that have joined us here today, to uh, our department leaders and staff who've done an incredible amount of work in bringing this particular uh, policy shift to fruition. We appreciate you, and to the extent uh, if the press have additional questions, uh, I think there's still maybe a couple hands raised, uh, please uh, don't hesitate to reach out to, to Tara, uh, since we, in some cases we may not have been able to get back to you. Thank you so much, uh, and I look forward to talking with you soon.